Let me uh, note this morning as we start uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. We're going to be seeing all morning on the screen our theme for the la- or next several weeks, including last week, is proclamation. And today it's women of influence, being women of influence, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. And so for those who were so gracious uh, and uh, to uh, submit pictures, you're going to be seeing them throughout the day. Uh, and, uh, and for those who did not, well... Hopefully that doesn't create anything for you to, to this afternoon. Um, maybe you missed the deadline, but uh, thank you for the many of you who did it, and you'll see that uh, on the screen, and we were able to include them in, because really we want to talk today. It's Mother's Day, and we want to honor mothers, and we're going to pray for mothers, but this is a message not just for mothers. It's a, it's a message for all of us, and we are to be influencers. And when I think of motherhood, that's one of the things I think of. Really, they shape and form and mold us as young men and young women, and that's one of the beautiful things that we have there. But I I have to start out uh, by recognizing there are those in this room that are hurting uh, because your uh, desire to have children and have not been privileged to do so. And there are those in the room today that uh, have lost children, and so this day is particularly hard, or perhaps you've lost your mother uh, in the recent past, and that's a challenge to you, and we recognize that, and our, our hearts go out to you. But I want to set a biblical precedent. I want us to break from culture. Because I I don't know how many of you get on Facebook and all those things. And I'm not on there all that much. I do have an account. But sometimes there seems to be in our culture such a bitterness uh, that comes out. And we have this weird idea that if somebody else is honored, we're dishonored. So I want to pause this morning and say, it is never a dishonoring to honor someone. All of us have birthdays, and on our birthday, somebody else has a day they probably passed away. To celebrate your birthday is not to dishonor the person who has passed away. Scripture says to rejoice with those who are rejoicing and to mourn with those who are mourning. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 comes to mind when I think of this. It says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And by the way, this is where our secular society is. It's reasoningly like a child. It's thinking like a child. And how does a child reason? How does a, how, how does a child think? Selfishly. I'm hurting. I'm upset. I'm not included because I'm a male or whatever it may be. And hence, hence somehow, you shouldn't be able to be happy. That is the flashpot of our contemporary culture. In fact, it's so important in Scripture that when God was giving the Ten Commandments, He listed this commandment just to address this idea. Thou shalt not covet. Right? It is to desire something that someone else has to the point of resentment of them. So when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I became a man, I put aside childish things. So I want to, say, I want to just challenge you in case you're, you're because I know you're hearing this, I, and I know you're not feeling this. This is not your expression, but I know you're hearing this in culture and society. How can, how can you celebrate this? How can you honor fathers, and how can you honor mothers, and how can you honor veterans, and how can you honor these different groups of people when I'm going through my struggle? And, and the truth of the matter is, when I is the center of the universe, you can't. When Jesus is the center of our heart, we can. Amen? So setting the foundation, we can honor mothers without dishonoring those who are not. I mean, that's a weird and foreign concept in our culture today. Because unless you recognize me, I don't want you recognizing anybody. That is, if you look at politics, if you look at society, if you look at everything, that's, that's the ongoing thing. But we are not that way in Christ. It must be a different way of thinking. And so if you're struggling this morning, we certainly empathize with those who are hurting. That we should do. But we don't choose not to honor out of selfishness. Does that make sense? Now that's a sermonette. That's a whole other day. And if you're mad at me, talk to me about it later. But for now... We're going to celebrate the gift of life, 
and we're going to celebrate not only mothers, but women, and we're going to celebrate all those, men included, that are proclaimers of the gospel. With that in mind, I want us to read Acts chapter 9. This was not in this week's readings, but I felt this is the message I should share today. It says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translates Dorcas. I don't really like that name, but it translates Dorcas. I'm not sure if she likes that name either, but she was always doing good works and acts of charity. And in those days, she became sick and died. And after washing her body, they placed her in the room upstairs. Since Lydia was near Joppa, and by, this, by, by the way, this is uh, modern-day Tel Aviv, the disciples heard that Peter was there, and two men were sent to beg of him, don't delay in coming to us. And so Peter got up and went to them, and when he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. And by the way, note how many times in Peter's life things happen in the room upstairs. It's, it's a fascinating study. Because Peter's always having his stuff happen upstairs. Even when he's taking a nap, things are happening upstairs. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me. But here they led him, they led him upstairs. And all the widows approached him, weeping and showing him the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. And then Peter sent them out of the room, and he knelt down and he prayed and turned towards the body and said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand. Then he called the saints and the widows and presented to her alive. This is because... uh, this became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now, this is a fascinating story about a woman of influence, a woman who made a difference in people's lives and proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ. Would it be nice if it was said of each one of us in this room that when we pass, not just those of our immediate family and a few close friends, but everybody wanted us back? better than saying, oh, good riddance. I'm glad we're done with them. (laughs) Dorcas was so influential, so impactful by giving her life to the cause of others and to the cause of Christ. She was a woman of incredible influence. Now, we're not told here that she's a mother, but whether you're a biological mother or you're just a, a, a friend or family member of somebody else, if you can be a person of influence for the kingdom of God, if you can make a difference in people's lives, it's important, it's significant. It will change the world. Male or female doesn't matter. We need to be like Tabitha. We need to be people who so into others' lives in such a way as to reshape society. We need this world to change. Now, you submitted photos, and they're running on the screen and, and over and over again. These photos are just pictures that you said, these individuals have made an impact on our life. And there's a lot more than what will ever be shown on this screen. And as you think about it, you'll think of more and more. And so I want to commend those who have already proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ. And I also want to encourage all of us in this room to be proclaimers of the gospel. Back in May 9th of 1914, Woodrow Wilson said this before Congress. He said, Woodrow Wilson said, that this day, that is the second Sunday in May, be set aside as a time for public expression of our love and reverence of mothers in our country. Theodore Roosevelt said something much more controversial. In fact, many in today's modern society would reject it. But listen, if you're an influence, whether it be biologically as a mother of children or whether it be through friendship or some other way, you are a significant contributor to society much bigger than you probably give yourself credit for. Theodore Roosevelt says this, When all is said and done, it is the mother, and the mother only, who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother and the mother who does her part in rearing and training a right, boys and girls, who are men and women of the next generation, is of greater use to the community and occupies, if she would only realize it, a more honorable and as well as more important position than any man in it. 
She is more important by far than any successful statesman or businessman, artist or scientist. Why? Because every successful person has been shaped by another. And mothers, godly mothers, as Abraham Lincoln notes, play an incredible role. Abraham Lincoln says this, No one is poor who had a godly mother. He went on to say, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have followed me. They have clung to me all of my life. All that I am and hope to be, I owe to my mother. Those are pretty bold and straightforward statements. Forming and shaping. Now listen, not everybody in this room has grown up in an ideal family. Not, not every one of us came out of Leave it to Beaver. Right? It doesn't happen that way. But all of us have been influenced by godly women who have poured into our lives. And sometimes that may have not have been your biological parents. It may have been somebody else. But praise God for those women and even those men, as we recognize all of us can be influencers for the kingdom of God that have poured in and prayed for and led our lives. All throughout Scripture, we see these individuals. We see them in Marion. When you got over Miriam, when you got over the sea, in Exodus chapter 5, verse 21, you know, she is the one that breaks out in the song in that verse and talks about the Lord being highly exalted and the horse and rider thrown into the sea. We often think it's men. Yeah, we took them down, took them down. But no, it's Miriam. Think about Ruth, who would forsake her customs, her family, her background, and everything else to follow Naomi and follow the God of Naomi and how she became an influencer and how she's included in the lineage of Jesus Christ and what a difference that she makes. Think about Deborah the prophetess who stood up and actually, as it was recorded, went down in history as being. She told him, said, look, if you, want the, if you want me, a female, to do this, I'll do this. If you want me to come along and be a part, I'll do that, but I'll get the glory instead of you. Well, she got the glory. As she led Israel, as she had confidence when all else around her didn't have confidence. And here is this wonderful prophet of God. Think about Esther, who took an incredibly bold stand. Think about the widow with Elijah who is about ready to feed her son their last meal and getting ready to die as there is a famine in the land, and yet in boldness she stepped out and made a difference. When you consider these women, they are women of significant contribution all throughout Scripture. Think about the widow with the two mites who Jesus recognized had given a greater gift than all those before or after her who gave much more as far as material wealth, but she gave out of what she had. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who in all the confusion uh, even endured scorn and scoffing for the person and for the name of Jesus Christ. These are women of influence. Some of them are directly mothers. Others of them are just ladies, but they're followers of God, and they make a difference. And I want to encourage you in this room today, I want to encourage particularly women, but every single one of us in this room today, you make a difference as you yield yourself to God. You see, Dorcas or Tabitha, she was a disciple of Jesus Christ. She was a visionary. She was starting small entrepreneur things long before the world was talking entrepreneurship. She was a servant of all, and she left a legacy so great that, that society couldn't even bear to let go of it. They were begging the disciples, do something about it if there's anybody. I'm sure other people died there too. But it was Dorcas that they said, we need her. I want to challenge us today, whether you're a biological mother, and listen, that is an honorable thing. Don't ever let anybody say to you, and, and listen, some mothers work or full-time, wow, you got an incredible job on your hand, and I commend you. Some mothers don't have the choice. Some mothers are single mothers. I commend you for serving the Lord Jesus Christ and moving forward in where you feel like you don't have, God provides. Amen? 
Some mothers are stay-at-home mothers and you didn't pursue a career path because you just felt that that was your calling and, and, and that's a wonderful thing and never feel less for it. You stand around in circles, they talk about, well, what's your career, what's your career? I'm a stay-at-home mom. How many of you could do that? Huh? Oh, it sounds good for the first hour. After that, it gets to be work. So never feel bad. If you're a mother, you are blessed. Scripture says children are an inheritance from the Lord. But it's not just about physically bearing that child. It's about influencing that child for the kingdom and the glory of God. Amen? And so therefore, if you're here today and biologically you've never had your own children, you can still be and are still commissioned to be an influencer. You don't have to bear the child to influence the child. And we see this through these scriptural accounts. But I also want to draw our attention to some contemporary history. And you may not realize this. We're, we're just a Sunday away from Pentecost. that marks the Feast of Pentecost. And there's a lot of rich history with that in a variety of different ways. But I want to kind of take you on a journey with some women you may or may not know about, some names you may or may not recognize, but these are women who have made a difference. Some of them were mothers, some of them were not mothers, but all of them were women of God who stepped up to the plate and were instruments in God's hand, and I hope that this will inspire you to be the person God has called you, called you to be. Agnes Oseman. Agnes Oseman probably don't know her. But you know what she was known for? She was a young lady in Topeka, Kansas, in Parham's Bible School. Now, Parham's tied to the early Pentecostal movement in the United States of America, and he was teaching something they had yet to experience. He was teaching this concept that the full gospel is all the gospel, and that God's Gifts of the Holy Spirit did not cease. That miracles could happen today. That tongues could happen today. The interpretation of tongues and prophecy could happen today. He was teaching this because he was saying, look, there's nowhere in Scripture this is said to have ended. And as he's teaching this in a Bible college, this young lady was sitting in that Bible college. This Agnes was sitting in the Bible college when she was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to utter in other tongues. Now, it was in Parham's Bible College, another gentleman you might recognize. In fact, it wasn't really at the Bible College. It was some of his lectures when he was in the South. This is a man, William Seymour. William Seymour had been around a lady. I don't have her picture, but Lucy Farrow. Lucy Farrow was out of Texas, and Lucy Farrow uh, had met William Seymour, and William Seymour had never seen a lady like this before because Lucy Farrow would pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, and she saw things happening in her life. He was introduced to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power of God through Lucy Farrow. And then he sought out the teaching of Parham, who was talking about this, and sat because he was African American. He was not allowed in the classroom. So he sat out in the hallway and asked that they would leave the door open in that day and age so he could hear the lecture. William Seymour, who was influenced by Agnes and by Lucy and also from Parham. William Seymour was the guy that was really the center of a revival called Azusa Street Revival. Out in California. You see, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that really was the formation of the movement, the Pentecostal Evangelical Church in America, this outpouring that happened in 1906, this outpouring was a result of women who stepped to the plate and were instruments of God, being filled and being used of God to be influencers, no matter what society. And I think it ironic, William Seymour, who was not even allowed in the Bible school classroom, what a wrong. You know, sometimes let's recognize it. Sometimes the church makes mistakes too. Okay? We can own that. Nothing's perfect. But our goal in our gospel, I love the heart of William Seymour because he didn't care that he was influenced by women. 
He didn't care that he was considered unacceptable or second-class citizen in society. He didn't even care that Parham said, you know, Jim Crow laws, I can't let you in the classroom. I don't really know what Parham's heart is. I can't judge him, and we, you, we shouldn't do that. But, but at the same time, he had to sit in that hallway. You know, your my thinking in present tense would be, Make, let him come into the classroom. Who cares what the world thinks? And I, I commend that. But at the same time, William Seymour didn't make an issue of it. He was willing to sit in, in the hallway way if that's what it meant that he had God. And that's what we need to be, men and women of influence. We keep going through the list. Rachel sighs love. This lady you might not know much about, but she was used of God and prophesied about a vision she was given. She lived in a small town in Springfield, Missouri. No good thing comes from Springfield, Missouri. My wife's favorite part of Springfield was the exit. Any Missourians in the congregation? I've got to be careful. You're not really Missourians. You're transplants. We were transplants too. Nothing wrong with Missouri. It just wasn't my wife's favorite place in all the planet of the earth. But here's the vision she received. A sparkling fountain would rise up from Springfield and would flow to the ends of the earth with a prophetic word. You know the largest Pentecostal movement in the world is stationed in Springfield, Missouri, the Assemblies of God. You see, it's women that God used. And ladies in this room today, know that you are a vessel. You are an influencer. Whether it be your own children, and even if it is your own children, even beyond your own children. But who has God given you to influence and make a difference? Abby Campbell. She was the first person to carry the Pentecostal message to the great state of Ohio. And I'm a Buckeye fan, so I have to to throw that in there. And so it begins to spread to the northeast, and you have Carrie Judd Montgomery. She was an infant. Early age in her life was healed through the ministry of a uh, holiness preacher and Pentecostal preacher, Elizabeth Mix. She became an instrument of God's blessing, and you can see she wrote the articles called Triumphs of Faith, the Journal of Healing and Holiness, And her and her husband established orphanages, missions training school, a home for peace, and served with the idea of missions and missions going back and forth from the U.S. This came from a lady of influence. Mothers never feel like you don't have something to give. You do. Women never feel like you don't have something to give. You do. Maria Woodsworth, Edder. She, an incredible woman of God, she preached so fervently, crowds of 25,000 people would show up. She received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and was profoundly changed in her ministry. In Lakeview Christian Center, up in Indianapolis, Assembly of God Church to this day, a large one to this day, was founded by her. Keep going through the list. Names you'll recognize, Amy Simple McPherson, Catherine Kuhlman, Allison Reynolds Flowers. You may or may not know this name, but Allison and her husband became one of the first secretary treasurers of the Assemblies of God. They also moved, as AG headquarters were in Ohio for a short period of time, then to St. Louis, and then on to Springfield, Missouri. We see this unfolding, but started uh, the Pentecostal Evangel, uh, and again, uh, some of the materials and curriculums that are put out today, and family moved and they founded churches in Ohio as well. You can keep going through the list and over and over and over again, you see this gracious hand of God working through women, women of influence. And my challenge to you today is, will you be a Tabitha? Will you be a woman who makes a difference? Will you stand up? Here's a name I got I to gotta use. And Maria Burgess Brown. With a name like Brown, I have to put her up there. Now, no, she's not my relative that I know of. We're all related in the kingdom of God. But here's a, here's a woman of God who received a degree from Moody Bible Institute, went out and began to preach the gospel 
but had this deep hungering for God and started meeting in these cottage prayer meetings and received the infilling of the Holy Spirit in a powerful and dynamic way in her life. She ran into a gentleman and met this guy, and they connected. And, and on her 26th birthday, she was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the gifts and the signs followed in her life. And she met this guy named Robert Brown, a Methodist minister in New York. She felt this burden for New York City, this Methodist minister in New York, and they married him. And they began a journey together as they founded what was called Glad Tidings Hall, Glad Tidings Assembly of God in New York City. The congregation rapidly grew through the 20s. They purchased other churches, kept growing and kept growing and kept growing, and it's become one of the largest Pentecostal influences in the city of New York. They reached out to the young people. They reached out to those on the street, and they pushed foreign missions, and they gave. And then Robert Brown in 1948 passed away. Maria had to make a tough choice. She felt this was her life calling. The rule of thumb would be step aside, let somebody else come in, but she didn't do that. She, at the Holy Spirit's edging, continued to pastor that church until she died in 1971 at 64 years of pastoral ministry in that church. Ladies, you can make a difference. There are other famous ladies you're aware of that made a difference because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Corey Ted Boone. That name ring a bell? She is a lady who hid. Her and her sister, who is less well known, both were instruments of God to protect Jews during, during the Holocaust. And they stepped up because of faith, of valuing of others. Missionary. We think of the end of the spear, right? Jim Elliott, his wife. We don't recognize this, but the only reason we talk about this story today is because Jim wasn't just slaughtered on the banks of that river. His wife went back and was determined to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why today you can go down to Ecuador and you can find people. The very man who killed her husband was a man she was able to lead to Christ. Now you talk about bold. Be influencers. Whether you have biological children or not, ladies in this room, you're called to be influencers for the kingdom and the glory of God. You can make a difference, and it does not matter what society says about you. It doesn't matter how you feel about yourself. What matters is that you avail yourself to the hand of God. You're raising those children. You don't know who you're raising. You might think they're just little terrors that God put in your life to teach you for what you did when you were a kid. Right? Well, they may be given to you as a gift, and they may be a gift to the world, and I encourage every mother of, who has children in the home to be an influencer for the kingdom of God. But it doesn't stop with your home. What else does God have for you to do? How else does God want you to impact this world? That is not belittling your role in the home. It's not belittling it in any way. It's just saying it's one part of your life. Because one day those children will grow up and they will move on. And what will be your role and what will be your identity? It has to be kingdom-centered. We need to be influencers in the kingdom of God. We are all called to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And when we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and put our confidence in God's word, at that moment in time, we begin to change the world. Whether it's starting a church, many of the key churches that have started were started by women. You might not realize that. They were bold women who proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Others under persecution like William Seymour and under rejection and maybe even substandard treatment by even fellow Christians. They could have got mad, and they could have went on a protest, but no, what did they do? They yielded their lives to God, and the world was forever changed. You see, we're in a world that says, get bitter. But with Christ, we get a whole lot better. We can make a bigger difference, not out of the bitterness of our spirit, but out of recognizing whom God has called us to be. No one in this room 
is not capable of doing what any of these individuals we've mentioned have done. You may feel incapable, you may feel unable to do that, but they only were able to do that by reliance upon the Holy Spirit, and hence you and I also rely upon the same Spirit. This is why Jesus said, go and do likewise. In fact, he said to his disciples, greater things than these you should do. Well, he certainly wasn't referring to the cross because none of us are sinless and we can't take upon us the weight of the world. He wasn't referring to that work of Christ. He was referring to the work in healing the sick, proclaiming the good news, touching the lives of those who are hurting, pausing for the woman with the issue of blood while he was on the way to, to deal with a very important political figure of the day and deal with his home situation. Jesus pauses, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If we will be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we will become influencers that actually change this world. We have a society, listen to it on the news, look at it on social media, that's screaming, change, change, change. And the only thing you're going to get with change, change, change from this world's perspective is shortchanged. If you don't believe it, all you have to do is read the history books. Over and over and over again, man is doomed to repeat the stupidity of his past. Now, I'm not talking about your husband's wives. Just mankind will go through the cycle. Oh, this government's better. This government's better. If we only had this, you know, it, none of it works. When you throw Christ out of the picture, it doesn't work. Christ has to be at the center of our lives. And how does he become the center? He doesn't become the center by us stepping back and saying, well, we'll let somebody else handle it. He becomes the center by us being like Tabitha or Dorcas, by stepping up and saying, I will do what I can do in my situation, and I will make a difference in my environment. Fighting for causes that are temporal will never change the world. Fighting for hearts that are eternal and proclaiming boldly and unapologetically, Jesus Christ, there is no other way, and you can't make him to be what you want him to be. He has to be what he is proclaimed to be. Fighting for that, that'll change lives. That'll cause the blind eyes to see and the lame to walk and the bitter heart to become sweet again. It'll cause rivers to split. It'll mend families anew. It'll give hope where there's only despair. It'll give answers where the world is only good at pointing out problems. It'll actually give real solutions. And whether you're a biological mother today or just a woman of God, Whatever you may be, you are an instrument in God's hands. No matter what age you are, you're an instrument. Some of these ladies started very young. Some of these ladies were much older, but they became influencers in their society, in their culture, by relying upon God. Now today, just in honoring mothers, we have a small gift for mothers when we dismiss from here. Uh, when you walk out these doors, just off to the right-hand side, mothers, just take that gift. We, we just give it. It's no way. It can't repay you. I mean, I could never repay my mother for what I did in torturing her. It just doesn't happen. My mother was tough. In fact, my kids know her. She's tough, isn't she? You don't mess with Grandma Brown, as they call her. Uh, jokingly, in the family, we say, my mother could probably bench press your dad. She's one tough lady. My mother grew up in a home that was extremely abusive. She grew up in a home that had no knowledge of Christ. She grew up in a home where a bar, and I'm not talking about Applebee's, I'm not talking about uh, 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 something that you typically walk in, a bar that most in this room wouldn't want to ever walk into was home. She grew up in an environment where she was beaten abused and mistreated emotionally and physically.
And she could have carried on that legacy. But instead, she carried on Jesus Christ. Instead, my siblings and I grew up in a home because a woman of God was willing to stand up to break from her past and to chart a different course. We grew up in a home where we were loved, and yes, she knew how to use the paddle. There she is on the, on the left-hand side. And by the way, I did not do this because I went to respect my mother, uh, and she had curls in her hair, and she would not appreciate it if I showed you the picture. She's curling 200 pounds. The bars are there. You don't mess with Grandma Brown. But what, what influence she had on our life was not at all about how strong she was or how determined she was to get through the difficulties. It was about the woman of God she was becoming. Not perfect at it, but becoming. She became an influencer that took a world of chaos and refused to pass that to the next generation. And I want to tell every parent in this room, I don't know what your background, I don't know how tough it is, but you don't have to pass it to the next generation. And for every potential parent in this room, you don't have to pass it to the next generation. Be a Dorcas, be a Tiabatha, be somebody who will stand up and say, I'm going to do things different. And I'm not going to do it by my might or my power, I'm going to do it by the name of Christ. You may be rejected or, or treated as a second-class citizen, male or female, in this society. People may look at you funny because you don't come from the place they come from. But don't let that hold you back from being the person that God has called you to be. Amen? She broke that mold and became a positive influencer. And I want to challenge everyone in this room, and especially mothers in this room, don't let society label you or your children. The kingdom of God is bigger than that. The kingdom of God is better than that. It's a wonderful gift we celebrate in Christianity. I hope someday, not to cause heartache or pain, that each one of us in this room have the same feeling by those who we leave behind should the Lord tarry the Tabitha had. Let's go find a man, a woman of God. Let's see if he can be raised. Come and do something about this. Let's not bury her yet. Let's just stick her upstairs. Imagine that. Let's go find a person of God, and may they be able to find one in you in making that difference. So mothers, would you stand to your feet this morning? All mothers in the room, I want to pray for you, but I want to pray for all of us. And these altars will be open in the next few moments. You're welcome to come to these altars, anyone. But I want to pray. Can we, can we, can we give these mothers a round of applause? Amen. And we don't dishonor anybody else by honoring mothers. We really don't. Our hearts go out to each and every person, but we commend you, ladies of God, for your role in shaping the next generation. Some of you, your role is never done as a mother. Some of you have the kids out of the house. You can celebrate. But your role is never done. Some of you have children that are very young, and there's a lot of questions you have. The answer is Jesus. Read all the books you want to get, and that's okay. But any of the mothers who have been around a while will tell you, the answer is Jesus. Because man can't do for you what the Holy Spirit can do. So we just thank you as mothers. We honor you this morning. I want to pray over the mothers, and then I'll pray for all of us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these ladies, these ladies of God. I can say that because they're here. We honor the gift you said children are a blessing from the Lord, and so these women are blessed. And we are grateful and celebrate with them in their blessing. And we honor them this morning. And we honor your work through their life to their immediate families. What a gift. What a blessing that is. 
Thank you for that. Now for them and for all of us in this room, mothers or not, male or female, Lord, we pray that you would make us all to be influencers like the women we saw in the scriptures, like the women we went down through the history. We just, all these were influencers, women of God who availed themselves to God to not just touch their family, but touch the entire world and all those around about us. And I pray that you will make us all to be like Tabitha, be influencers in our circle, in our sphere, whether or not we're ever recognized, whether or not we're ever named, whether or not we ever go down in the history books because there's so many people that are never recognized. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you can still use us. In fact, you want to use us in greater ways than we've been ever used before. Help us to rely upon your spirit and to speak the truth in love, but to speak the truth and be instruments in your hand. We ask that in Jesus' name. The body says, amen. Let's stand to our feet together.